Hello, bonjour, and welcome to your new RG1 Exchange video. Welcome to this channel where we taste and explore together and explain the world of fine and rare wine. This is episode number two of our series about the prestigious Champagne wine region of France, of course this area that makes some of the finest sparkling wines in the world. In this series we're gradually explaining the different facets of the region and the wines and how and why it gets to make such refined bubblies. After looking last week at the seven different grapes used in Champagne, you can catch up on that video right here, today I want you, I want us to investigate how different parts of this large wine growing area differ from one another and why it actually matters to the taste and the character of every wine. Champagne as a whole is the coolest wine region in France which in part explains why it makes such fine sparkling wine. But of course the climate is not all. And while you may think of Champagne as one single vineyard area, it is in fact a rather large region with very significant variations in climate, but more importantly in soil composition and topography. Of course soils are famously in Champagne more or less always rich in limestone, which again explains the finesse of the wines here. But there is not only one type of limestone soil, of course, there are variations in which mineral is more present in which soil, how much silt, how much sand, how much clay in each vineyard, it simply varies. The Champagne region widely spreads over about 35,000 hectares, that's more than 85,000 acres, and over 319 different villages and five departements or counties. Needless to say that every vineyard is not the same in each village as it is in the next one, right? Let alone in the 319 different villages. There are five major sub-regions or districts in Champagne that we'll cover here, each making a slightly different style of wine. You may have been wondering why different Champagne houses and brands that you buy taste different. Well, a significant part of it relates to where they source their grapes from and how they blend grapes from different parts. Because yes, one of the major advantage of Champagne, the region, over other sparkling wine producing regions around the world is this exact variety of terroirs champagne makers have available for crafting different wines, very complex, combining different qualities of different grapes grown under varied conditions. So they can just blend them and mix them up to make the best possible wine. So here are the different components winemakers have in champagne available to them with the five different sub-regions we're going to cover now. As a quick note though, before we go, if you want to explore each area and their unique character individually, you'll have to buy and look into grower producer champagnes or small champagne vignerons as we call them, who don't blend the different areas as much as the big houses do. They just make wine from their estate vineyard, so you get to the root of the local expression of each grapes with champagne vignerons. But let's dig into those five sub-regions of champagne now. To simplify, these two, if you wish, are the two areas that are more specialized at growing the best red grapes, the Pinot Noir and the Pinot Meunier. Now if you haven't watched part one of this Champagne series about the grapes of Champagne that I published last week, make sure to watch it as well so you understand a bit better what we're talking about here when it comes to grapes in Champagne. So the Montagne de Reims is almost literally a mountain and that's why it's called this way. Or let's say it's a huge geological formation with a plateau and a forest at the top. And that's between Reims and the other famous Champagne city of Epernay that everyone knows because of the avenue of Champagne in Epernay that counts with all the top houses or many of the top houses. Now this area, the Montagne de Reims, has some of the most diverse soils in Champagne because vineyards are around this massive formation, so they're not all equal. Yet this area is most known for its top Pinot Noirs in particular, even though they do produce some Chardonnay and Pinot Meunier. It's the area that counts with the most Grand Cru villages in Champagne, so the very best ones including prestigious village names such as Ambonnet, Bouzy, Verzonnet or Verzy. Now west of Epernay is the large valley flanking the Marne River, therefore called the Marne Valley or the Valley de la Marne in French. Because this region is prone to frost and is more dominated by clay and sand soil composition rather than chalk, 
Pinot Meunier works best because vines here bud late and grapes ripen earlier. So if you want to explore the joys and the impact of Pinot Meunier in a blend, and I said last week that Pinot Meunier is really fruity and outgoing and really pleasant, well look out for small growers from the Valley de la Marne. As the name of this area indicates, the Côte des Blancs, whose name translates literally from French as the slopes of the whites, the Côte des Blancs grows mainly the white grape of Champagne, which is, of course, Chardonnay. Chardonnay represents more than 80% of the production here, and this is because this slope has a very unique, extremely chalky soil. You can tell when you're there that there's a lot of chalk in the soil, it's white and it's powdery in some fashion, and red grapes don't like this very much, while Chardonnay absolutely loves it. So in this very rare type of soil that virtually no other wine region in the world has, Chardonnay gets its finest, most elegant, mineral and very crisp expression. If you love your champagne to be very crisp and zingy, really precise and mineral when you taste it, well this is the area to look for and houses use this very crisp component to provide acidity and tension to broader, bigger blends. There are a plethora of illustrious Grand Cru villages here in the Côte des Blancs because we're talking about some of the best Chardonnay grapes in the world grown in that area. Such famous prestigious village names such as Cramont, Avis, Auger or Le Ménil sur Auger. Fantastic area. The three areas mentioned so far are in the heart of the very glamorous vineyards of Champagne where most of the top houses are located, either in Reims or in Epernay. Yet Champagne is bigger and even more diverse than this, it's absolutely full of wonders. So a little bit to the south is what's called the Côte de Cézanne. So this is the southern continuum of the Côte des Blancs, the same slope that we talked about that continues south. It's a small area relative to the others, so I won't develop all that much here, but let's say that it's also Chardonnay territory, as the soil is still very chalky, but the soils are a little heavier and clay rich, resulting in a slightly richer, rounder, more mellowed style of champagne. Now, if you continue driving south, even further south from there, and if you ever visit Champagne, I certainly recommend that you do to see perhaps a more rural side of Champagne, but one that is extremely welcoming and interesting. People are so very friendly and welcoming and warming down there. Worth going if you ever go to that area. Anyhow, you'll first get to the beautiful city of Troyes, which is definitely worth a stop, but you'll have to continue driving further and further to the southeast of Troyes to get to this relatively remote vineyard area of Champagne that is called the Côte des Bars in the Aube département rather than the Marne for the geeky ones in the crowd. And we're actually getting really closer to Chablis than we are from the rest of Champagne really. So wines are a little richer here, fuller bodied, some might call them maybe a little more rustic perhaps, but I'd say they have more personality to them with a little grip to the palate and this extrovert character that is absolutely really lovely. I find it fascinating myself. So this is certainly an abundant source of fascinating grower champagne wines to explore and of great value as well. And this part also supplies a lot of wine to the champagne houses to the north of France and Epernay that they use in their blends. Because wines from the Aube add this extra dimension and their own personality traits to the champagne. As a conclusion, of course, when you buy a bottle of champagne, the art of blending, the crafting of fine bubbles and the savoir-faire, the know-how of the houses acquired over the centuries, all of this have already combined the qualities of those diverse regions into the bottle of wine. All of these different sub-regions are blended to make and deliver you the most enjoyable and balanced wine. Yet, what's behind the consistent perfection that we love in Champagne is this exact diversity of terroir which you don't necessarily appreciate for itself because you don't really necessarily find it in a branded Champagne. But without which, this diversity, champagne wouldn't nearly be as good as it is. It takes all kinds to make a world. 
and I'll leave it here for today. Thanks for watching. In the next episode of our champagne series coming up very soon, we'll look into the sweetness levels of champagne, the brut, the extra brut, the demi sec, what they mean and what they do and how the houses and the winemakers use them. And we'll look at why they matter. So make sure to stay tuned to the channel for this. Take care in the meantime, and I will see you soon in the wonderful world of fine wine, champagne, and much, much more. Au revoir. Cheers.